Hello, hello, and welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. My windows are having fun with me right now. Hi, how are you? Have you ever imagined what it would be like to learn that your Black ancestor was an enslaver? How would that make you feel? Our special guest today, Philip J. Nicholas, has pondered this question. And we're going to today, we're going to learn about his research. And guess what? We're going to the islands. Yes, we are going to the Caribbean today. This is Genealogy Quick Start's first time in the Caribbean. Next time, I actually want to dip my, my toes into some Caribbean water. How are you today? Welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. I am Shamel Jordan, your host. Today we have two amazing quick starts for you. One is Survey Says, There Goes the Neighborhood. <clears throat> Jim and Michael are going to share yet another way to squeeze information out of land surveys. Anything mappy is great, you know, it's just like pesto. Anything you add pesto to, it's automatically going to be great. You add maps to genealogy, magic happens. And then we have enslaved to enslaver in the British West Indies. And like I said, we are going to the Caribbean. So grab your suit. But first, I want to know where you're from. Where are you watching from? Let us know if you're with a genealogy group, definitely put that into the chat. And while you do that, I'm going to bring on my buddies, my favorite buddies. First up, Jim Beidler, columnist and editor. How are you, Jim? I am also, doing well. Also, we have Michael John Neal. How are you, Michael? I'm perfect today. Perfect today. <laughs> Happens once every four years, that. so we're good. Yeah, we're good. We're good. There, there, there was a lady at my my former church who used to reply to that by by saying, "I'm just a little bit better than perfect." Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, I didn't like her either, but. <laughs> <laughs> you are crazy. So, you know, I I posed the question um, about having an ancestor that's an enslaver. Um, do either of you have any enslavers in your family and how do you handle it? I know I know for sure that I have one direct line ancestor uh, who was an enslaver. Oh, uh, I, I know that from the fact that his executors uh, did manumit the uh, the two enslaved persons. Uh, and those are on file at the, the Berks County Recorder of Deeds office. Oh, uh, and how do I how do I handle it? Very carefully, very gingerly, because uh, uh, to, to me, to me, with, with my Pennsylvania German ancestors, the the nut of it is how these people who were basically serfs in Europe, because all, all mine came over in the 1700s, had they then turn a, turn around and justify in their mind treating others even worse than they'd been treated? I'm going to be working on this one a long time, maybe forever. <laughs> I, I do have enslavers. I've got several in Virginia and in Maryland, um, probably at least a at least a dozen, I would say, um, individuals uh, from up to the Civil War. Um, my my approach to handling it is I research everything on that person. I can find the good, the bad, and the ugly, as the movie as the movie says, and and let the records reflect what happened as best I can. Um, and 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 try and try to research all the people involved in the situation: the enslaver, the enslaved, the children, and let the details fall where they may. I mean, because what happened is what happened. The only person whose actions you are really responsible for is your own, and you just try to make your research reflect everything as accurately as you can, not leaving anything out, which is the main. Um, the main thing to the, I think the main thing to realize that we all 
have an integral part in the good and the bad and the range in between of our past. And learning about that, acknowledging that is an important part of our genealogy research. Yep. That's a multidimensional story. It yeah, is, definitely. Yeah. So guys, thank you for that. I am so excited to get into your mappy kind of talk today. Um, we are going to do survey says there goes the neighborhood so have your ancestors had any cool it, hey nabigail is that nabigail that's nabigail hello nabigail <laughs> have She'll any of either of your ancestors film. had you know an interest in hood that you'd like to share well the the one the one that uh, strikes to my mind is is actually the neighborhood i still live in uh, cause I'm for the, for those of you, who, I don't assume anybody, uh, remembers this, that I I'm in a house that's been in my family a hundred years. Uh, and a lot of my ancestors were concentrated in that area going, going back and back. Um, and I encountered when I was doing the research on the larger property that my six acres had come from. Uh, I found a situation where uh, there are a lot of clusters from the exact same European village. Uh, and marriages between, uh, within those communities were more common than between the communities. But one that was between... Oh, uh, I, I, I got to think it was a, you know, he got her pregnant and, and married her because he died fairly soon after they had had one child. And then the, the, uh, the wife sued her father-in-law saying that he was, he was keeping, keeping her personal property from her, blah, blah, blah. I, I have a feeling this was more about the 451 acres <laughs> than some, ni some knives and forks, but you know, whatever. Oh, uh, and, um, and how it all ends up is she remarries somebody who was from the same European village, uh, an immigrant descendant, instead of this mixed marriage of things. Uh, and they settle that land by the granddaughter of that father-in-law. Uh, that granddaughter uh, and inherits this whole 451 acres, uh, which is kind of kind of cool. I guess she's like age six when she becomes yeah. the heiress to uh, to all this so so yeah that's a that's a definite neighborhood story i thought um the 1950 census was a very interesting way to look at neighborhoods and i think it went enumerator by enumerator but just by looking page by page you got to learn a lot about the neighborhood and who came in and out and i never ever thought about the fact and I saw it in multiple houses that people bought summer homes in Berlin during the summer, during picking season. People who lived in Philly, I saw that again and again and again. So yeah, look at those census records and learn about, about the neighborhood. You never know what you might find. Michael, did you have something neighborhoody? Um, all my maternal ancestors came from a handful of villages in Northern Germany and they emigrated and they pretty much some exceptions <laughs> almost recreated those villages in small settlements when they when they emigrated they you know made little towns where the vast majority of people were from that same uh, same small location they were related to each other when they emigrated they just kept getting more related to each other <laughs> the, um, because as jim you, you married within the community especially in the first two or three generations uh, after emigration you married within the community um, okay. and, and, that, and lots and lots of groups ethnic groups did that you didn't marry didn't marry outside the group um you waited makes a few sense. generations to assimilate i guess is how that normally makes works. sense so before we get started with our great quick start let's say hello to who we have here today hello angela from houston tom bruce from amarillo texas Hello, Wayne and Gracie Ann from um, down the street in Jersey. Hello, C. Davis in Detroit. Denise Payne in Netherlands, nice to see you. Hello, Kate J. Uh, me. 
Hello from Manio. That's Katie. <laughs> you broke oh, the code, huh? <laughs> like, not these German people again, but it's Katie. Hello, Katie. Um, hi, Cassie from Cleveland. And let's see, Katie, Katie, Katie. Yes, it is you. So let's go ahead and get started. And I apologize to anyone with the Facebook issue. I'm not happy about that. So thank you for joining us via YouTube. So let's get going with our quick start. Survey says, and how many of you guys remember what show that came from? Survey says, there goes the neighborhood. So what's this all about anyway, guys? Survey says in the neighborhood. Well, we're going to look today at records of land surveys, particularly in, not always in meets and bounds states, but the vast majority of them are in meets and bounds states that delineate property boundaries and the lengths and the, the angles and the measurements. Often, not always, they can give in addition to the rocks and trees that bordered your forebears property or the creek or the stream, the actual names of the neighboring adjoining landowners in in some not all cases and that can be a good way to help you get a feel for who your ancestors neighbors are especially in those time periods where there aren't other records to help us find out who some of the neighbors were the legal surveys and legal descriptions can help us to do that so that's what we're talking about today we're going to, to survey those records <laughs> a survey of the surveys i love it we saw what you did there, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to step one. Step one is were they landowners? So what can you use to figure out the answer to this question? Well, of course, uh, land deeds, uh, property atlases, things like that. Uh, tax records, perhaps. Probate records may mention land ownership. And there was something else that just went right. Census records head. have that Census nice O there. I love that O. <laughs> or the, more of the property value as well could indicate yep. that. Um, yep. All right. So first, were they landowners? Then step two, locate the land. So are you guys saying we got to get out of We got to go there or we need to map it? Like, how do you do this? In terms of accessing the records that we're going to talk about today, you've at least got to know the county where in which it's located because we're going to, the bulk of the records that we're going to look at, with some exceptions, are county level records. There are some state or colonial or federal records too, but you've got to have an idea of what you don't have to know precisely for some of the things that we're going to talk about today, but you at least want to have the county uh, to locate some of the county level records. That okay, doing. that's easy, county. I could do that. I could do that. All right, we're on the step three. We are not we suggesting you take a shovel and go find it and take some of great, great, great grandpa's dirt home with you. We are not going to suggest <laughs> that today. <laughs> they have nice well, little necklaces and they have <laughs> red clay dirt in Alabama. I love that red clay dirt. I actually have some in my laundry room that I wanted to make some necklaces out of, but I digress. Step three find the various surveys. So what do you mean? And tell us what a survey is anyway. Like what's a survey? Yeah, sir. A survey. I mean, they used to do it and they, well, they still do it, you know, with, with these camera type things. Uh, when you go back in time, they used a, a long chain and basically what they're doing is they're, they're marking the boundaries of the property. Uh, and they're, they're using a length and an angle to represent that uh, and you'll see when we get to the to the examples uh, a little bit a little bit better what the what the deal is so you've got line segments then you'll have corners and if you go back to the old the old ones we're talking to a stone in the road we're talking the black oak tree the fallen spanish oak tree all all <laughs> sorts of all sorts of exotic things that you're never going to find today well uh, jim yeah. jim did have to mention stone in the road today they wouldn't use a stone but they would put they will insert markers uh, yes i know when, when we have one done the the original point of reference and sometimes today will be just one point of reference not all the corners will be marked like they would be in say 17 whatever but there was a i think it was a metal rod that was in the yeah. center of the state highway that was the initial reference point from which all the uh, preceding measurements were referenced okay. from. Okay. 
So did you say what all like can we get like what are the where do you get these surveys but to, at? But to find them the the ones that I'm going to talk about are county level records in the recorder's office. The same that would be in the same office that records the land deeds. Okay. Um, and this can vary from one location to another. That would be if you don't know where they're at, that would be the place to start. The office that has land records. If they don't have the surveys, they should they would hopefully know where the surveys, if they had to be recorded, would be at. And surveys have to be recorded. Um, so there's a record copy of it, just like a land deed. Well, so, and you know, they might have surveys from 1950. Are they going to have surveys from 1850? Yeah, they could. Okay. Well, they, well, they are in, they in federal land states. They're, they're not, they're, they're not going to have that noise in, uh, in state land states. They don't uh, do any surveys today? They, well, they, there are tax assessment surveys and where you're going to, where you're going to find them is in the probate office. Uh, cause after somebody's death, especially if they were died in testate, then they're going to do new surveys of all the decedents land. Cause in a lot of cases they would parcel it up. They would say, okay, there's three sons. Partition so we're, up, we're right. yeah, we're going to, we're going to create a partition of these. Uh, and that's that's where where uh, where my examples are going to come from are register of wills documents that are attached to the uh, to the estates. <laughs> okay. But you guys to, ready but to go the, ahead, oh, yeah, but the overarching thing to remember is even if the deed record office doesn't have them, they'll know where they'll know where they're at. Yeah. Are, they, are they commonly yeah. like you know we can get probate records from Family Search and we can look. You know, they have them where we can browse the records. Are these browsable in some way? Or you pretty much have to go to the state archives or the county location? These are one of the, especially I'd say 20th century ones and later, are one of the things that Family Search didn't always uh, okay. microfilm. And again, most of the county records that are online, it had to be something Family Search originally microfilmed. Right, wow. right, right, and it and and uh, you know even for the probate offices, it will vary from county to county what Family Search has. Right. In some cases, they they did microfilm all the loose papers, and these type of surveys will be there. Other okay. times, they just microfilm the books, the will books, the orphans court books. In some of the orphans court books, I've seen surveys recopied into. Uh, but uh, but not always. There's a there's a lot of loose stuff going on there that uh, you may be missing. Okay, thank you for this because I don't see these often, and I just always wondered where I get them, and I need to talk to the people at the locations to find in, out where they are. In federal land states, they'll be in separate record books. They're right, separate Michael, books. tell us what federal land states are, and Jim, tell us what state land states Fed, are. Uh, federal land states are states that land is described in townships and sections uh, using the east and west with the ranges and the meridians townships and sections quarter sections and all of that starting with the northwest ordinance of 1787. Wait, that, that's, the, that's the five second answer to a longer question one, one key word michael rectangles they're beautiful squares and rectangles whereas in the state land states it's called meets and bounds so that's all these boundaries that i was talking about angles and line segments and it's a freaking crazy quilt uh that uh that the the people in the midwest don't have to deal with until until they get back to their, their ancestors to the state land states then would that be like the original colonies would be yeah. more so on yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. So did you guys want to share some surveys? Let's see yeah, what we just have. Pull here. one up and we'll <laughs> this is a this is a relatively recent one. This one's from um probably early 1940s. Mimka. And the uh father owned all this property, and when he died, it was uh part well. The three sons split it up. And after they, the story was they walked it out based on the value of the property. This was how they decided to allocate it amongst the three sons. And, and a survey was done. Um, they went out, they surveyed it, they put markers. You see where on the bottom that, why am I pointing? You can't see me pointing. In the bottom, in the middle, there's a stone. That's a state that, uh, 
what you see at an angle there is a state highway. It's not indicated on the map, but that's a state highway. And okay. there must have been a stone or a mar more likely a marker put in the state highway as a reference point. But then it's Mimka and George and Lewis, uh, the acreages that they got. There's a railroad track. The Wabash Railroad ran through the back part of it that was put there sometime after the grandfather of all three of these men purchased it. And then you see those little marky things there for George. George got a chunk out of the center. And then he also got what was north of the railroad track. Okay. Oh, okay. Because Very nice. George things. was the man. Let's see what else we have here. What's this? This is the first record we talked about was a county level record from the 1940s. This is a survey plat from Maryland, uh, Harford County, Maryland, I think in the early, yeah, early 1800s. And George was the first individual who uh, owned, so to speak, this piece of property. And this was the original survey of that. Um, and then there was a patent that gave him title to that property. Um, I didn't include the meets and bounds description is included for the sake of space. I didn't include that. These are all mm -hmm. the Maryland state archives uh, website. That's where I obtained this digital image of that, but this makes a good point. It's got, it's a meets and bounds description. Like Jim was talking about all those lines and all those, uh, all those corners there. This one did not mention names of any neighbors. Everything was trees, rocks, and, and angles and lengths but some of these things do mention do mention neighbors but it makes a good point they were they had never heard of a square or a rectangle <laughs> um, <laughs> this do we one want is to go to the next step or do we want to go to the next survey um we can go to the next survey um, okay here we go we were talking about the local records. One of the things they would do in meets and bounds states, in some states, they would procession periodically, which they would go back every so often and remark the corners because trees die, rocks, you know, life happens. And so periodically they would go back and they would re-survey the parcels so the lines kept uh, could be clearly marked over over time and this was one from 1803 in amherst county virginia this one mentioned the the guy's name thomas sled is 85 acres is right there in the in the middle of that there are some neighbors that are mentioned um you can see it starting in the bot why do i keep pointing you can't see me point <laughs> i do it again you can see william written upside down and then you can see where over on the left, like he's t rotated it and then he's written William Ware uh, on there. And I don't think there's another neighbor listed there unless unless I zoom mm. in. But on these, mm. since there were others living nearby, I, you'll see neighbors names uh, listed. So William Ware must have had the property to the to the west and to the south of my ancestors, mm -hmm. 85, 85 acres. And this looks like new timber all around new here. New timber, yeah. I mean, you've kind of got a the, the the drawback to when things are uh, in black and white. The original of this could have had what's that word? Color on it. And <laughs> some of the it's possible some of these words were in different ink or different color, which I can't tell looking at a black and white image. I love it. Red oak looks like a cherry tree. Looks like a cherry oak. All right. So next survey. These are, these are going to be mine, and these go along with the fourth step to analyze the adjoiners. All so. right, let's go on to the fourth. So we find these surveys. You know, we have to dig a little deeper for these. And, oh, sorry, I went way down. Where am I? Sorry. <laughs> we are on step four is to <laughs> analyze the adjoiners. So what's a joiner? Tom, uh, Tom Joiner in the morning show? Like, what are we talking about? No, it has a D in it, but um, yeah, when you put a D in it, it means the <laughs> the neighboring property owners. So add joiner. Thank you. Yep. Sorry for the misspelling. So it's the neighbors. Okay. So we ready to share the next? Uh, yep. Survey? I'm gonna do it. Don't tease me. <laughs> Let's see. Here we go. Oh, I love this. This is gorgeous. Yeah, well, this is uh, this is actually from the Joseph Easter Estate, and this is a guy who was a former governor of Pennsylvania, and he owned many properties, but his his uh, 
crown jewel, so to say, with 724 acres in Burn Township, not far from me. And uh, he's he's got a lot of adjoining property owners, probably about a dozen listed. And, you know, dead, dead in the center top of the map, Valentine Epler to his left, Jacob Gicker. Uh, and, you know, these are these are just loads of, uh, you know, good information, placing them in time as being the the neighbors. And then if you go on to the next one, uh, the oh, um, uh, yeah, and this is like I say, this is this one's John, actually. Oh, uh, th- these were two cousins. And uh, they are adjoining property owners, uh, both in the Plum Creek Valley in, in Burn Township, Berks County. Uh, some of the adjoiners are, are the same, uh, but then this ex- kind of extends the neighborhood. And these were fairly close in time. These are only about three years apart. Uh, so you get a larger neighborhood out of this. If you uh, do a few more probates from that time period, you may have a huge uh, neighborhood that you've now documented what were the, the farmsteads and smaller uh, parcels of the time. I love when it says late, you know, even though they're yeah, not alive, and, you still have the money. Right. And that should, well, that should be pointed out that that uh, doesn't necessarily mean the individual is dead. It, oh. probably, it probably means that they formerly owned the property. Oh, really? Yeah. Yep. It could go either way on that, but generally, because generally they're 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 doing this survey, and they're saying, "Well, who? Well, who's who's the neighbor here?" And they're like, well, "I don't know," but Gabriel Heaster used to own it, oh. and then they put, then they dress that up as saying, "Late Gabriel Heaster." So nice, nice, nice. So this is like your cluster you're building here. Yeah. Yeah, this is the this is the neighborhood for sure. The hood, you, you got the, your hood yeah. going on. You could do the probates of those neighbors, and then see how you know just keep building it. And it would be the one thing you want to keep in mind, though. They're all at little different points in time, so you might yeah. get some migratory things going on there too. And yep. you get a lot of late references, but that's just because you're behind schedule and doing your research. <laughs> <laughs> And so step five would to be to look for surveys from, from other periods. And, and this is just adding intent to what Michael was saying is, you know, do, do, do probates from another generation forward and see how the neighborhood has changed right. or not changed, depending, depending on the neighborhood. Changed. <laughs> and it would be excellent, you know, to even do a pro the probates of the neighbors may mention your ancestor and how their property ownership has changed. Even if you can't find actual records on the ancestor, probates of neighbors, you know, may show how it was split up, even though you can't find for whatever reason, you can't find the records of that split yourself. That is an amazing suggestion. I don't know how many times I've gone to look for probate records where you ex- the time that you expect them to be there and they're not there because you said they could the case could be open for a long time. But if you look at the neighbors, they could give you little snippets of what's going on. I love that. I love it. Thank you for that. Let's take a look at our steps for survey says there goes the neighborhood. So step one is were they landowners? Step two, locate the land. Step three, find the various surveys, not just one and done. Keep looking. Step four, analyze the ad joiners. And step five, look for surveys from other periods, including other neighbors. I love that. What a fantastic quick start. Guys, thank you so very much, and we'll see you shortly. We'll see you. I love map stuff. Don't you love map stuff? Oh, my gosh. I have not dug into this survey stuff, and I think I need to go deeper. We have some new people here. Hello. Um, Jay Hammonds from Compton, California. I'm digging the West Coast. I haven't seen the West Coast here today. You're the first one, I think. Um, hello, Dr. Shelley. It's nice to see you. 
Yes, we need to collect that dirt, those soil samples, right? Make some jewelry out of them. Um, Dr. Shelley actually dresses up when she researches. She has a little hat from like the colonial era that she puts on when she does research. Dr. Shelley, I got to get me some headgear. So I think you could channel my ancestors that way. Hello, Quintilla from Cleveland. Hello, Karen Harrison, Harrison from Harford County, Maryland. Hi, nice to see you. And hey, Jean from AAGG and Augs Family Quest in Philly. Nice to see you guys. Let's get ready for our next quick start. Philip's waiting. Give me a second. All right, welcome back to our second quick start. Let me just tell you, when you have good friends, you have good friends and you know it. You don't have to question. I said, look, I need someone who does Caribbean research because I get beat up. I can't do but so much. I can't do but so much. And I reached out to a friend and I said I needed someone and they sent me our special guest, Philip J. Nicholas. And like I said, you guys ready to go to the islands? All right, let's get ready to go to the islands. We have our buddy coming on, Philip J. Nicholas. Hello, Philip. How are you? Good. How are you, Chanel? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it is so nice to have you here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be sending the link to the show out to so many people who have been beating me up. I think I'm giving a good presentation. They say, what about the Caribbean? And I'm like, uh. So, Philip, you're going to really help us out and help out some of our viewers today. So, Philip, all of our special guests, we ask the same question. Please share with us your um, one-minute genealogy story, how you got started, and how you knew you were hooked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say my story pretty much started when I was young. Um, growing up, I, I knew my maternal grandfather. I didn't get, well, I didn't get to know him. He died in 1969. So I was, there was this desire in me to want to know a little bit more about him. And then also my parents were immigrants to the United States. So I wanted to know like, where did they came from? Um, know a little bit more about their background and also to kind of a little bit know more about where does my resilience and drive to succeed come from? So that's yes. kind of like what kickstarted me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's incredible. You have to be our first special guest <laughs> who is looking back for the traits that they feel like they've inherited. That is absolutely yes. <laughs> beautiful because yeah. seriously, there's things that come so easily to you and you're like, I didn't, you know, yeah. you know, you, you have to look back. So amen to exactly. you for realizing <laughs> that you're not like the first and the greatest of everything, even though you are quite exactly. great. Oh. All right. <laughs> so let's get started with your quick start called Enslaved to Enslaver in the British West Indies. So mm -hmm. first, what are the British West Indies? I've heard you're West Indian. I just yeah. know Caribbean and it's all mm -hmm. the same to me. So yes. define what the British West Indies are. Yes. So the British West Indies are the Caribbean islands that are associated with Great Britain. So they have hist historical ties to the United Kingdom, um, the English speaking islands. So that's what are the British West Indies, like Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda, and many more other islands. Okay. It took a while. It took like my second trip to Jamaica to realize <laughs> that they were speaking with a British accent. Yeah. Like it took a long, like, I'm like, there's something unique, but they were just, they were <laughs> speaking with that British. Like, I just love Jamaica. So let's keep going. Yeah. So <laughs> let's go ahead and get started with um, step one, which mm -hmm. is to gather information from family. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your journey to gather information on your ancestry. Yeah. So I, this is always a step that I definitely recommend to anybody that's doing research on their family is first go meet up with um, your family, uh, ask some questions about 
maybe grandparents or aunts, uncles, cousins that they might know, because that, that kind of helps you start out when you're trying to push back further into your past. So definitely gather information from your family, make sure to record it or document it somehow so you, you know ahead of time. Yes, write it down, yeah. record it. Ask them, yeah. right? Make sure you get permission. You can't just record yes. people <laughs> on the sly. You know, so much that easier now. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't lose that trust. All that right. And so um, step two is to um, search church records. So first, tell us about this ancestor that we're about to see in this beautiful baptism record. Mm -hmm. Yes, so George Newell, um, so he was born during slavery um, in Jamaica. And here on this baptismal record, you can see he, at the, the top image, you can see that he was born in 1811. And he was the son of Joseph Newell and Elizabeth Boner. And he was born in the parish of St. Dorothy, which currently doesn't exist. It's now been incorporated into the parish of St. Catherine. But this is an image of a baptismal record in the early 1800s in Jamaica. Okay, mulatto, age 13 months, belonging mm -hmm. to. Okay, so he was born, yeah. in, is this showing him born enslaved? So uh, George Newell was born enslaved and then freed a few days. I'm not sure. Um, actually, I don't know the exact date from his birth when he was freed, but he was freed as on the baptism. It shows that he was a freed child of color. Oh, okay. Okay. It yeah. does show that. I see it as big as it's big as day free. Let me yes. show y'all. He was free y'all. So he yes. started out enslaved. How was he freed? Yes. So he was freed by his father, who is a white man. His mother was an enslaved woman. So his father manumitted uh, or paid money for his son to be freed. And he, his father did not own him. It was another enslaver who had owned uh, George Newell's mother and George Newell himself. Okay, so he bought his son, but he freed his son. Did he free his the mother of his son? He did not free the mother. Okay. Is there, are these baptism records available online? Yes, these records are available online on familysearch.org. So you, you, it's free. Uh, all you have to do is create a username and password and then you can access the records. Yeah. Okay, okay. So that's a uh, baptism records. Let's go ahead and look, go to step three which is to locate probate records on the island. So you're making a distinction here where the baptism yes. records not on the island? So there are baptism records on the island. That's actually where the original documents are held. But thanks to the Mormons, they've been digitized and they're readily available online. Whereas opposed with the probate records, there are some probate records that have been digitized and that are available online, but the majority are on the island in Jamaica. And that's something that I recommend to researchers to constantly, you want to augment your research while you're, um, so you can, you know, know the full picture and the story of your, your ancestor. Okay, we have, a, this is the will of mm -hmm. Joseph. So Joseph is the one, who's Joseph to George? So Joseph is George's father. Yeah. yeah. So yes, these are images of the will of Joseph Newell. And in his will, he, he mentions his son who was um, just recently manumitted, or not recently, but had lately been manumitted. He mentions the name of his son's mother and does state that she was an enslaved. She had died before this will was um, okay. written. So she did die in an enslaved woman. And then he also identifies other family members and other children that he had, um, he had fathered and also left money for them to be manumitted and itemized some of his properties. But in this will, 
he lists his estates. He, he turns it over to his son, George Newell, but his son at this time is, in, is a toddler, is a young adolescent, so he instructs his friends to be his son's legal guardian. So this, this is the information that you can gather from this will. And he does mention his friend's names um, by name in this will. And so those are pretty key, like we were just talking about in the surveys with the adjoiners that they, you know, they're important and they can help provide information about your ancestors. So it looks like he took care of his son and the other children that he fathered by enslaved women in his will. Correct. Okay. Or he at least <laughs> left funds or some kind of allowance or property to his children. Were his children all emancipated or were some still enslaved? So his children were all emancipated except one son. I noticed he did leave um, to be, he did leave money to be manumitted, but he current, he remained enslaved throughout until slavery was abolished in 1834. Okay, wow. Wonder what happened there. All right, so um, <laughs> probate records on the island, are they similar to the probate records you might find in the United States? Yes, they're similar. They do, um, they do list the executors and yes, I would say they're definitely similar to wills or other probate records here in the United States. And the records are also available on FamilySearch? Some of them are. There are some that are available from 1756 to 1927 that um, for Jamaica and some of the other islands, there are available online. But the bulk, again, is mostly available on the island. You will have to visit some of the repositories. Oh, man, you mean we have to actually go to the Caribbean? Yes. <laughs> are there any British islands that are better for research than others? I will say I am a little biased. <laughs> I will say Jamaica and Barbados, I would say, are the best as far as like being able to access those records and okay. um, conducting your research on the islands. And in addition, they are most of those records are a lot of those records have been digitized and are available online whereas the other islands not not that's not the case okay okay maybe i need to go and work with the lds and do family search and say i need the <laughs> island i will go and i will i will scan away i will go can you think i could do that Philip? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do that as well. <laughs> All right, we got a team going on. Anybody else mm -hmm. want to go to the islands with me and Philip <laughs> to scan for family search? We're creating, you know, a power block of people who are going to the islands. Yes. All right, we have located our probate records on the island. We are yes. now moving on to step four, which is to search governmental records. So these are like the yes. federal level records, or do you have like a, do they have counties? or another so, type of jurisdiction that's bigger than a town? So yes, they do have parishes. There's several parishes in Jamaica or, or even in the other islands as well. Um, in particular to Jamaica, since we're focusing on George Newell's story, there are several. There's Clarendon, St. Catherine, Kingston. There's many um, parishes. And the parishes were not fixed until 1866. But prior to that, there was many more but some of them were incorporated into uh, the parishes that stand today. And okay. there are records in each of the different parishes, but all of those records go to the main, the, the archives there in Jamaica and the registrar's general's department. Okay. And they do a good job with scanning at that, in that island, for that island? Yes, they do. All right. So I think you have, this is pretty interesting. I'm going to share this document, your governmental record. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and what are we looking at here, Philip? So these are slave registers for Jamaica. And actually the slave registers are 
available in the National Archives at Kew. But for this slave register, you see that George Newell is listed as the owner. And then Alexander Lumsden is listed as his legal guardian because again, George Newell was young at this time. And here are all the slaves that George Newell owned. So a slave register will list the name of the owners, the name or place of residence, which is the parish name, the name of the slave, which is, you know, usually lists their given name, their slave name. And in some instances or many instances, when if a slave had been baptized, this would also include their full Christian name. So first and last name. Mm. And it lists their racial backgrounds so their origin. And it what lists their What does Creole age. mean in this context? Yes. So in this context, Creole means that they're born on the island as opposed to African. So as you can see, two of, or three of the women listed mm -hmm. in this register are from Africa. So these women had survived the transatlantic slave trade and were living in Jamaica. Oh man, hey Mary and Betty and Suki. Yes. You made it girls. I wonder how <laughs> one, uh, they're related. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, these are, the, yeah. these are their sons, son of Suki. Yes. yes, and son of Suki, yes. So it would list, it would also list like for some of the children, their mother's name will be listed right in the remarks section. So you'll see that. And as we just, just briefly discussed for African or Creole, that was, so their nationality was recorded. This is amazing. This is absolutely yeah. amazing. So yeah. these are the people, mm -hmm. seven, four, uh, so in six total, people six people that were owned by formerly, your ancestor. Correct. And formerly owned by his father, Joseph Newell. So I have to ask you, mm -hmm. you know, how does it feel having an ancestor who was an enslaver? Yeah, it. I will say first, before I answer that, prior to doing this research, I was aware on my maternal side that there were I did have white ancestry, so I had already assumed that perhaps they were they were enslavers. But once I started doing my research and or conducting this research and uncovering that I had ancestors who were of African descent owning other people of African descent, that was definitely disheartening uh, and shocking. I will say, and, and definitely challenging. It has changed my perspective on this whole, the institution of slavery, because it's it's not what, you know, like what we envision or thought of, think of it as. So uh, just like Jim and Michael were saying about, you know, doing further research to understand more and contextualize it, and also learn about the people that were enslaved is critical and important going forward. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a multi-dimensional story. Um, there's no, you know, all the people who were enslavers look like this and all the people mm. who were enslaved look like that. Um, mm. And that's why we all need to get out there and learn and tell our stories because that's what makes the, um, the story a lot more rich and a lot more interesting. So exactly. um, let's move on. I think you have some more records here. Um, mm -hmm. Slave Registrar. Uh, this is another yes. one. Let's take a look yes. at this one. What's how is this one? So the one that we just looked at before we move on, mm -hmm. the one that we yes. just looked at, it was from 1817. Is that correct? Something that they did regularly? Because like mm -hmm. here we have, you know, the, the every 10 years they counted. So was that yeah. something they did regularly? Yes. So yes, the actually the registers, the slave registers were initially created because right after the abolition of the Slave Trade Act in 1807, the British colonies wanted to, you know, track all the illicit transportation of slaves to the colonies. So starting for Jamaica, for instance, starting in 1817, they started recording and documenting every enslaved owned in Jamaica and it would be the next three interval years. So you would your next slave register would be 1820, 
1823, 1826, 1829, and then 1832. Now, I will say everybody born prior to 1817, they only had to be listed for the 1817. So for the next slave registers, it was based on increases on the estates and decreases on the estates. Now, okay. sometimes you will get the individual born prior to 1817 in a later register. Mm -hmm. And that's because perhaps there was a transfer of ownership of the estate. So then you'll be able to know, you know, you'll be able to kind of track, but it is kind of difficult tracking your ancestor from 1817 on to 1832. Yeah, welcome to the slave trade. So tell us yeah. about this one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is actually a slave register for 1832. And at, as you can see in this one, George Newell is now a young adult. So he's, he's, he was able to write his own or uh, record his own um, entry for the slaves that he did own. And as you can see, for one of the enslaved men that he did own named Gain, he sold him. It doesn't distinguish or distinctly uh, mention who he sold Gain to, but he was sold. So this was a decrease on his estate. So Gain was initially mentioned in the first slave return that could be recorded in 1817. And now he's mentioned again in 1832 because he's been removed from the estate. So bringing George Newell's enslaved um, numbers, the number of enslaved people that he did own down to five. Down to five. Okay. Correct. All right. So that's a, another slave register. And this would have been like yes. the last year of the slave registers? So the last year was actually 1834, because that's okay. the year that slavery was abolished throughout the British West Indies. But Jamaica only has slave returns for, slave registers for 1832. Mm -hmm. And then yes, here at the bottom, you can see where George Noy is, is X for his mark to um, confirm that he acknowledges that this is the correct return for the register for the slaves that he has owned by 1832. Okay, so yeah, here's the decrease of the male here. The past Correct. one, it looks like there is a female that has disappeared from 17 to 32. So that's, oh, I, I got to adopt the Jamaican. See, I knew I yes. was going to Jamaica <laughs> for a reason. I love these. These are a lot more interesting than mm -hmm. ours. Anything's always uh, more interesting when it's nah. new. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so step four, five mm -hmm. is to locate property records. So you're, you told yeah. me about these almanacs. So what are these? Yes. Almanacs. Yes. So almanacs are records. They're like property records that show so here in this image is a transcription of the actual, the original almanacs. They're available on jamaicanfamilysearch.com. But yes, almanacs are property records where you can locate all the individuals in Jamaica that owned land and it sometimes list the estates that they owned. And prior to slavery was abolished, it also lists the amount of enslaved people that they did own, as well as stocks. What's this little number? The number, so which number are you referring to? The state mm -hmm. of. Okay, so for George Armstrong, it doesn't, he didn't own, it, it, it didn't list the exact estate that he did own. So it just okay. says estate of. But okay. eight refers to, since it's the only number that was listed, it refers to the amount of enslaved people that he had owned. And this oh. was an almanac for 1817. So he owned eight enslaved people in the parish of St. Dorothy. Okay, okay. And I think you have another almanac page. Yes. There's another one. Yes. Oh, here's and your George. George. Yep, so this is George Newell who owned Sacaba and he had owned six enslaved people. 
The person right directly above him, Elizabeth Byfield Newell, was the housekeeper, was Joseph Newell, so George Newell's father's housekeeper. He also, she was also a free woman and she, she, was, she received enslaved people from George, Joseph Newell as well. Okay. What's the And this is all done. So Sacaba was the name of the estate. Okay. That, yes, that George Newell owned. Mm -hmm. That he had inherited from his father, Joseph Newell. Mm -hmm. And so you said these almanacs are available um, online? Yes, they're available online on, so the website is jamaicanfamilysearch.com and you can find almanacs from, it starts from the late 18th century to going up to the late 19th century. Okay, yeah. they look pretty interesting. I never yeah. even heard of them. Mm -hmm. And so um, you have this other, Looks like a database. Oh, we love databases. <laughs> Tell us what this is here. Yes. So this is actually part of the last step that I kind of mentioned. It's the Legacies of British Slavery Database. And this database was actually created as a project for the University College London, which they were doing to kind of understand how slavery had shaped British history and also played a role in de the development of modern Britain. So here on this database, it lists all the enslaved people that own property throughout the British colonies, so the British West Indies. And it also provides statistical information on how much enslaved people they owned on each property and the names of the properties. And sometimes there are maps connected to the individuals in this database. Now, and what's the database, this database again? Can you re repeat it? We are, our time is about to end. Yes, yes. So yes, this database, what is a pro it was based on a project from University College London, students okay. who were trying to understand how s colonial slavery had shaped and transformed um, modern Britain, and also how, yes, how it had shaped uh, British history. So that's amazing, what amazing site. I had never heard of that site before. Yeah. I'm definitely <laughs> going to go take a look at that. Um, step uh, six is basically to document your findings. Um, yes. Philip, I loved all those documents. I want to adopt <laughs> a Jamaican or a British West Indian so that I can have some slave registers to look at too. Let's take a look at <laughs> Philip's quick start. Enslaved mm -hmm. to enslaver in the British Isle, British West Indies. Step one is to gather information from family. We're all used to that. Step two is to locate church records. Step three is to look for probate records on the island. Step four is to search for governmental records. Step five is to locate property records. What's all this spelling? I need a new assistant. I really need a new assistant. Um, step six is to document your findings. Um, fantastic, Philip. Thank you so much oh, for welcome. that. Let's you're bring welcome. on Jim and Michael. Did you guys have any um, questions for Philip out there? We actually have like 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> Michael's mouthing something. He must be talking. Yeah, to I think you muted it. All right. So we will. I think I have one thing here. Is that Michael telling me something? That was a fantastic show, guys. I'm definitely. Um, Denise said, very interesting and complimentary to my own research on enslaved people in Dutch West Indy Islands. All right. You might need to come on the show and talk about that. I love the diaspora, learning about the diaspora. Everyone, thank you so much. Jim, Michael, and Philip. we appreciate all of your knowledge. Everyone have a great day. Thank you, Shamil. Thanks, guys. Bye.